blast off. It is time to begin. I love this verse in the Bible. It says, the battle is not yours, but God's. Isn't that, doesn't that make you feel good? The battle is not ours. Well, we're going to sing about that, and the name of the song happens to be, The Battle Belongs to the Lord. A great song by Jamie Collins. Let's sing together. In heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. The weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in hard, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend. Your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. Let's pray together. And Father, it does indeed give us peace to know that the battle's not ours. To know that the all-powerful God is the one who rules the battle. And so, Lord, when the things of this, this earth begin to get to be more than we can handle. Would you remind us that we know the end of the story? Thank you, Lord, that we don't have those worries. Help us to give them to you. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather once again in, in your house and knowing that there are those who have gathered with us as well from home. We're grateful that through the uh, technology that's afforded us, we have been able to stay connected. So thank you for allowing us to gather once again, to pray together, to sing together, and to study your word together. Father, we thank you for Brother Donnie and for the, the study that he'll bring to us. Thank you for his insight and Thank you that you've inspired his words. But once again, Father, we ask that you would help us to listen, yes, to his words, but help us to hear your voice. And as we study your word, would you reveal yourself to us, Father? Prepare us for a new week that's to come. Help us to be sensitive to opportunities that come our way to to be all that we can be as your children and help us to remember that when the day is over and Sunday is done that we are still the church so help us Lord to be the church triumphant thank you for calling us together 
Thank you for gifting us and giving us the opportunity to come and share our gifts with one another and then to be, to be the body of Christ. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your precious son. Thank you for your sweet Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing once again. And the song says, why do I sing about Jesus? Well, it also answers the question. He is my Lord and my Savior, and dying, He set me free. So let's sing together. Why do I sing about Jesus? Deep in my heart there's a gladness. Jesus has saved me from sin. Praise to his name, what a Savior, cleansing without and within. Why do I sing about Jesus? Why is he precious to me? He is my Lord and my Savior, dying he said me free only a glimpse of his goodness that was sufficient for me only one look at the savior then was my spirit set free why do i sing about jesus why is he precious to me? He is my Lord and my Savior. Dying, he set me free. He is the fairest of fair ones. He is the lily, the rose. Rivers of mercy surround him. Grace, love, and pity he shows. Why do I sing about Jesus? Why is he precious to me? He is my Lord and my Savior, dying. He set me free. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still in all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife, discord filled my life with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Feasting on the riches of his grace, resting neath his sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face. That is why I shout and sing. Jesus. 
Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing of his cleansing power. to walk again and cause the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Bless the Lord who reigns in beauty. Bless the Lord who reigns with wisdom and with power. Bless the Lord who fills my life with so much love. He can make a perfect heart. Praise the Lord who reigns in beauty. Praise the Lord who reigns with wisdom and with power. Praise the Lord who fills my life with so much love. He can make a perfect heart. He can make a perfect Thank you, Brother Woody. It's good to see you all tonight. Lovely crowd of folks. Um, I thought about making a joke about being lovely, but I thought, no, I better not do that. 
No, just lovely, lovely crowd of folks. So good to see you. What a wonderful morning we had. Just the church, the building was like full, you know. Had people here for the very first time. Maybe you bumped into some of those first timers and were able to welcome them, make them feel at home. It was just a great day, great day. Well, we are, as you know, in the book of Ruth on Sunday nights. We have been looking at Ruth now for some while. Into chapter 2, we have seen this family who's had a really hard time. Famine came. Elimelech and his wife and his two sons went off to Moab. They got there. Elimelech dies the two boys get married. The two boys die. She's going to go back home, having lost everything. One daughter-in-law stays in Moab. One insists on coming with her. And so back they go to Bethlehem. And there they begin their life in a terrible poverty. Even though there is food, there, they have no food. So where we were last week, we saw that Ruth had asked Naomi if she could go out and just kind of pick up what the harvesters of the barley crop left behind. And in chapter 2, um, Ruth had asked in verse 2, we're not going to go back and see that again, but it's just the connection in verse 2 and verse 10 where we stopped is in this part. Please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I may find favor. She's asking that of Naomi for permission to go, and Naomi says, go, my daughter, but it's just almost there's the desperation of a prayer that I may find favor. Well, she goes, and you know that things have gone pretty well in the morning. She's by happenstance or by God's direction she has ended up in Boaz's field and when we got to verse 10 which is where we were when we stopped last Sunday she has this encounter with Boaz he says stay here in my field if you get thirsty go and get water from that my servants have drawn and she fell on her face she bowed to the ground and said to him why have I found favor we should not be terribly surprised the prayer of verse 2 is answered in verse 10 why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner that is a major theme in the book of Ruth is that Ruth is not Jewish she wasn't born and raised in this land she was from Moab they had different traditions different culture but most importantly a different God Chemosh but she has come to be a follower of Yahweh. Now, there is no place in this text that says Ruth began to believe in the God of the Jews. But it it's underpins the text all along the way when she says to Naomi, where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. It's almost like that's her confession of faith. And the people around her begin to see that too as I think we will catch a piece of in the story for tonight but that's where we stopped last time I am hoping uh, to get tonight down through verse 20 so let me read from verse 11 down through verse 20 and we'll see how much of that we're able to do so Boaz replied to her all that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me and how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know may the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to seek refuge then she said I have found favor in your sight. Again, she says the same words. I've found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly to your maidservant. 
though I am not like one of your maidservants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here, that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. Now, I'm not sure that sounds too good. Mm. But, you know, vinegar and a little bit of olive oil together is not too bad. So she sat beside the reapers, and he served her some roasted grain, and she ate and was satisfied and had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz commanded his servants, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not insult her. Also, you shall purposely pull out for her some grain from the bundles and leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah, which best I can tell is about two-thirds of a bushel. I, I searched that out, and I found all kinds of different measurements, but that was a kind of consistent around, which would be an awful lot of grain to just haphazardly pick up behind the harvesters. It was an ephod of barley. And she took it up, and she went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also took it out, and she gave Naomi what she had left after she had been satisfied. Her mother-in-law then said to her, Where did you glean today, and where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. If it was a soap opera, it just would have gone into a reverb, you know, Boaz. <laughs> Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, the man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. Now, I'm not terribly happy with that last translation, closest relatives. I'll come back to that when we get to there, hopefully in just a moment. So that's the text that we want to deal with. Let's just kind of back up now and go through it sort of piece by piece. So we've come to verse 11. We're now plowing some new ground. Boaz is having a conversation with her. Already she has you know, fallen on her face, bowing down to the ground. I found favor in your sight. You've noticed me even though I'm a foreigner. Well, even though he didn't know her by face, he knew her by story. And he, he says there, everything that you've done, what you've done for your mother-in-law, you know, the death of your husband, I've heard all of these things. Do you know why she had heard all those things? It was a little town. We sing about it even to this day. O oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Well, we know what happens in little towns. <laughs> everybody knows everybody else's business. And you can kick against the pricks or you can just give in to it and just let it go because they're going to know anyway. They're going to know, you know, well, they know more than, they know as much as you know about them, they know about you. you know. So Boaz already knew all of her story. He had heard it. It had gone around the village, around the town. So he didn't know her by sight, but he knew her by the reputation that she had, and the reputation was good. People were saying good things about her. She had left her father, she had left her mother, she had left the land of her birth, and she had come to a people that she didn't previously know. That's a hard thing to do. That, that's also sort of a reoccurring theme in the book of, of Ruth is the courage that it took for these women to do these things, and especially for Ruth to do this. And she is, she's led in part through this whole story by the love that she has for her mother-in-law. But as the story moves along and as it unfolds, it seems to me that we see a growing love and a growing depth of faith in this woman as well. She has taken some very hard steps, in my opinion, because she has come to believe that the God of the Hebrew people is the true God. And so Boaz speaks to her again with religious words, with faith words. He doesn't say, oh, wow, you've done a really good thing. I'm proud of you. Uh, he may have said those kind of things too, but 
he couched the whole conversation in the language of God. May the Lord, and again, I've said it so many times, but you're getting where you recognize it every time you see it, so that there you see the, the, the O and the R and the D are a small size print, but they are capital letters. So that tells you that what is behind the Hebrew word behind that word is the covenant name of God, Yahweh or Jehovah. And you will hear me almost always say Yahweh. That's what my teacher said in school. So that's what I'm going to say as well. And the truth of the matter is nobody knows quite how to pronounce that word. And I think I've explained this a little bit before as well. But the reason nobody really knows how to pronounce that word is because in the written form, Hebrew did not have vowels. It did not have vowels. So they know the four consonants that make up this, the tetragrammaton, the four-letter word, but they don't know what the vowels were. And so when the Masoretic scribes in the 6th and 7th century A.D. started adding vowels to it, they didn't know which ones to put there because nobody remembered. They didn't remember because the name of God was so holy that they wouldn't say it. And when they read the text, every time they came to the word Yahweh, instead of saying Yahweh, they would say Adonai, which is the Hebrew word for Lord. Now, the word Adonai appears in this text in just a little bit from here. Let me see, where is it? Uh, oh, yes, in verse 13. Look, I'm jumping ahead here. I'm going to come back. But then she said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord. Well, now... That's the same English word, but it's not the same Hebrew word. Behind that one, you notice it does not have capital O, capital R, capital D in small letters. It has regular small O-R-D. And so that indicates to you that the Hebrew word that's behind that is Adonai, which was the Hebrew word for Lord like, sir, mister. The recognition of somebody who has some level of authority or, or honor or something above you much like we would say yes sir they would say yes Adonai it was a, a word of politeness the Lord God is on occasion addressed as Adonai but whenever you see it as the capital L-O-R-D the word behind it is Yahweh and so here is Boaz speaking the words of the kingdom of God may Yahweh may the Lord Yahweh our covenant God reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord may God pay you for the kind of life you have lived in and for the faith decision you have made the God of Israel now here's a sweet little phrase under whose wings you have come to seek refuge now, I don't know probably if we were thinking in New Testament terms we would say something like you have been converted to the Lord. Instead of the poetic phrase, under whose wings, I mean, you might would say to a new believer in Christ, you've now come under the wings of Jesus. But we probably wouldn't. <laughs> we would say, born again. That, that's our little metaphorical phrase. But there, his little phrase that he's using there, you have come under the wings of the covenant God of the Hebrew people. And like I've already emphasized, I think that that is an indicator of the fact that it is being recognized in Ruth that she's not just a foreigner that's come to live with her mother-in-law, but she's a person who has come to believe in the God of the Hebrew people. Now, this word, interestingly enough, that is here translated under whose wings, the same Hebrew word appears one more time in the book of Ruth. The word shows up about a hundred times or so in the whole Old Testament. More often than not, it's translated like wing or the extremity or something of that sort. But on occasion, it has another uh, interpretation. And in this case, in chapter 3, so we're jumping way ahead of the story, so don't be reading too much of it. But in chapter 3, verse 9, there's been a whole lot more that's happened Oh, it's going to be fun when we get around to seeing all of that. But he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid, so spread your covering over your maid. Now, the same word that is translated over here in chapter 2, uh, 
verse 12 as wing is here translated covering. Or I don't want to tell much of that story, but she has done a scandalous thing. <laughs> she's gone to where the men have worked and slept overnight, and she's kind of laid down at the feet of Boaz. She uncovered his feet, and she laid down there, and he woke up and saw this young woman laying at his feet. And he, who are you? <laughs> I'm Ruth. She says, cover me. Now, there are biblical scholars who see inside that text more sexual stuff than what I'm going to see. There, there is a love story there, but there's a, a redemption story that's going on. And the same expression that he made to her when he described her faith, you have come under the wings of God. She is going to make a plea to him after a while that she may come under his protection and under his covering and that he will redeem her in a way that we will see. I just thought it was very interesting that that same word showed up twice in this book. Once when it described her faith, she's come under the wings of Yahweh, the God of the Hebrew people, and now she's going to ask, may I come under your wing? And it's just the, ink, it's the same Hebrew word. It's just the translators thought, well, come under your covering, maybe says it in a way that's more clear as to what she was asking. But she was asking for his help and his protection just like he had recognized that she had come under the help and protection of the Almighty God. But we'll come back to that when we get to chapter 3 and see some more implications of that little conversation there. But uh, she's come under the wings. You have come to seek refuge. And then she said, again, I have found favor in your sight. Now she's all to getting like, oh my gracious, this morning that's what we asked for and that's what God has provided. We asked for it, he has provided it. And I, I just have to say that I find that to be God's typical response to our prayers. On Wednesday nights, we're looking at prayers of all kinds from all kinds of different people. And I think about my, my own prayer life. And when I get into a pinch, I, I tend to go to God, very much like you do, and say, help. And then, not too far after that, a lot of times the pinch gets resolved. It's fairly rare that I then go back and say, thank you. Because most of the time, the circumstances of the resolution of the pinch don't look divine. They look like the normal outflow of life. I mean, life happens. And I was hurting this morning when I prayed, and now the cause of the hurt has gone away. It's like, oh, don't worry about it anymore. It's taken care of. <laughs> it reminds me of the story of the guy who was getting stuck in a flood, you know, and he said, Lord, help. And in a little while, a boat comes by, and he said, I, I, no, I'm waiting for the Lord. You, you've heard that story. And so, he, <laughs> Lord, help. And then a helicopter comes by, and he said, that's all right. I'm waiting for the Lord. Well, <laughs> you know, he was waiting for something that looked supernatural. Well, the boat came by and the helicopter came by. They were all supernatural. It's how it happens in our lives that we seek the Lord and then it happens and it's like as though we didn't even see it. It just went zipping right on by. How could we reframe ourselves so that we lived in such a, a, a dynamic of the relationship with God that when we sought him for something and then what we sought him for happens that we recognize the divine hand in that. I think Ruth is, but it's just so glare, it just jumps out at you. Oh, that we will find favor with someone and now why have I found favor? I have found favor. Those are her exact words. The same thing that she'd been looking for, God gave her. 
when you're looking for it and it's there, God gave it. I have found favor in your sight, my Lord Adonai, for you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly. I, I did not look up what word is used by King James or several others. I just didn't have time to look at that very carefully where my, my version says, and indeed have spoken kindly to your maidservant. Do you have something other than kindly in any of your versions? Friendly, okay. Anything else? Friendly, kindly. The heart. The heart? To the heart. To the heart. Thank you, Ken. That's a more literal translation of the word there. He had been kind, but the actual Hebrew word is the word that indicates the heart. I may be over-reading the story, but I believe hearts are starting to palpitate already. Now, if you don't know what I mean by hearts starting to palpitate, you're just growing a little too old. You just don't remember. <laughs> we were little bitty kids just barely teenagers. And our, our fathers played on the church softball league. And so we kids would come to the softball games where our fathers were playing, but we didn't care anything about seeing our old dads out there hitting the softball around and running around those bases looking like kind of like walruses plopping from one base to the other. So we went off in some other direction. I don't know, we might have been like 13, 12, pretty young pretty young and so I was in one swing she was in the other swing she may remember it differently I, I reached across to that swing and held her hand we swung back and forth we'd fall out of that thing now if we tried any foolishness like that it got my heart sort of beating just to be holding her hand now, she dated other guys after that. I don't know why. I dated other girls, too. But the Lord put us back together sometime later on. But I have never forgotten. She may have. I don't, do you remember that? Yeah, thank you. You had to say yes. What else could you say? She's heard me tell the story before. I've never forgotten that teenage sense of a palpitating heart holding a girl's hand. It was fun. Now, that's just a silly story from my past, but I think that's starting to happen. They didn't expect it. Boaz went out to the field just to inspect the workers, and this strange girl showed up, and you know, I don't, I don't know what he can see of her face. Today, Bedouin women are pretty much from head to toe or covered up. You can't see them. She was kind of like in a Bedouin culture, but I believe those thousands of years ago, they were a little bolder. He knew she was a woman, and he knew who she was, and he's starting to like, I don't know, head over heels. He's, give her some grain, throw the grain on the floor. Don't you rebuke her. Pull some out of the sheep and put it down there. <laughs> so she says to him, you have spoken to my heart, to your maidservant, even though I'm not like yours. And so it seems like there's a little bit of something starting to blossom here. I may be overreading the story, but you look at his behavior. I mean, this is just a strange woman that's out picking up grain, barley in his field. And now he gets to verse 14. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. You can just see them dipping vinegar together. <laughs> that doesn't sound like much of a love thing, but maybe it is. Who knows? In some cultures, if you put your bread in the vinegar with me, it means we're going to get married. Uh, so she sat beside the reapers, and he served her roasted grain. And she ate it, and she was satisfied, and she had a little left over after all that was over. And so I, I think 
there's something more than just a poor person getting grain in, her, in his field now. When she rose up to glean, now Boaz gets, I mean, he's just, his servants probably thought, what? Okay. He commanded his servant saying, let her glean even among the sheaves. Don't you insult her. And now purposefully pull out some of your grain from the bundles and put it down on the ground. And don't rebuke her for her coming up and, and gathering it. And so now we're at verse 17. She gleaned the field until evening. So this was a long day's work. She started early in the morning, gleaned through the heat of the day, late into the evening. She's out in a field. Some of you have done that kind of stuff. You picked cotton when you were a child. You know that just about kills you. She was bent over all day long, picking up barley. When she got to the end of the day, she beat it out an unimaginable amount for somebody who's just picking up what's left behind in the harvest, as I indicated a little while ago, probably about two-thirds of a bushel. Now, barley and wheat are very similar in that they are, you know, they're a, a grain, a cereal that has like a kernel on the inside of a husk. And the husk has to be removed, and these are things that we see a lot of times in biblical imagery like the winnowing and those kind of things but the actual process was here's the grain that you've collected and now you've got to get the kernel out of the husk so it's a beating thing they could throw it in the air and it would blow the husk away and the grain would fall back to the ground or something of that sort so it's a pretty intensive amount of labor to get the actual kernels out of there so for her to have gathered enough that even after the winnowing process she has about two-thirds of a bushel of grain left she has picked up a lot and Boaz has helped her tremendously y you would hardly think that you could survive off of the gleanings one person that I read said this would have been enough grain to last them two weeks in one day's gleaning from the harvest she has enough that's going to last her for two weeks so the, the super abundance of what she's able to gather in just that one day. So she has what she had gleaned and she took it up. She went into the city and there was her mother-in-law. She showed it to her mother-in-law what she had gleaned. She was also able to give to her mother-in-law, Naomi, what had been left over from the roasted grain that Boaz had given her at lunchtime. So now it's kind of like Naomi pitches a softball and Ruth is going to knock it out of the park or you've got the straight man in the punchline. Even though it's not a funny thing, it's in the story. You, maybe you can imagine how you as a child especially heard stories over and over again or you read stories or you read them to your children and they they knew what was coming in the story um, I read this little storybook to my granddaughter every day and where's spot and you flip the page and there's spot in the piano and you lift up the little thing and there's a hippopotamus in the piano and there's a lion under the stairs and there's a turtle under the rug you finally find but she is so excited to, I mean, we've read this thing a hundred times. And it's got like four words on every page. <laughs> and she can't wait. She peels back the covers of the wardrobe and there's a monkey in there eating a banana. Some of you have read this book. This might be one of your favorites. I said, is Spot in the, in the closet? No. What's in the closet? Nana. We get to the end of it, and he's in the basket, and she lifts up the little piece of paper, and there he is, and she's excited. All, she's looked at that dog a hundred times, but she's excited every time. So, you know, with that sort of thing in mind, as silly as that is, this is one of the books that's read every year when Jewish people of Orthodox faith gather for a particular kind of celebration. They read the book of Ruth. And you can imagine 
you're coming to this part of the story and you've read it every year for decades and you get to this little part and her mother-in-law says to her where did you glean today and you know the answer where did you go to work may he who took notice of you be blessed so she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz now Ruth didn't know anything about Boaz Boaz knew everything about Ruth but she didn't know anything about Boaz other than he had been a man who had been kind to her and she threw out maybe a couple little flirty words and she didn't know anything about this guy but Naomi knew him well where did you can see her over there she's eating the leftovers well where did you go today I worked in the field of a man whose name was Boaz. <laughs> Boaz. Boaz. So no wonder in the next verse, his name was Boaz, and Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, you almost have to read this with a whole lot of excitement because surely that's the way Naomi is talking Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Ruth is probably saying, What? Naomi went on to say, The man is our relative. He's one of our kinsmen redeemers. His actual word that should be there translated instead of closest relatives I think kinsman redeemer is the right little phrase so we're, we're kind of to the heart the meat of tonight's time together here oh may he be blessed of the Lord Yahweh there again and she is now talking about Yahweh she's talking about God May Boaz be blessed of the Lord, for the Lord has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. You will remember when Naomi had returned from Moab that she had said, The Lord has dealt unkindly with me. He has been hard on me. And she had had a really hard time. Life had been really hard. It's not a fairy tale. This is real people who lived real lives, whose husband really died, whose sons really died. This was hard. But I said to you at that time that I think Naomi got her theology wrong, that the Lord had not been hard to her. Life had been hard to her. And, and, and I also said to you it's really difficult. It's a, it's a piece that we Christians, I think, have to hold on to both sides. We have to hold on to both sides, that, that God is sovereign in the universe and in the lives of people. And at the same time, God honors truly the freedom that people have. Decisions that we make are true decisions. We're not playing out some drama that God has already written. So somehow, I don't know how we hold on to both of those easily, but nevertheless, they're both biblical truths, that God is sovereign over the details of the universe and that God honors the freedom of men and women and the decisions that we make. And they are not, they're not false. It's not false freedom. It's true freedom. They had truly decided to go to Moab. And while they were in there, life had taken hard turns, and her husband has died. Death comes to us. And sometimes death comes to our children. That's one of the hardest pieces I know. Some of you have had that. You've been there. And how God's sovereignty works into all of that, maybe we'll work on that some more in future times. I don't know all the ways that it does. But everything that is good is of God. Everything that is good is of God. And when life takes hard turns, the goodness of God is still there. We've seen that several times. You know, the whole Romans 8, 28 thing that we took four weeks to work through. You know, the goodness of God is still there. It's by faith that we see the goodness of God. Sometimes it's just by faith. Faith 
sees more clearly than sight, by the way. And it's almost as though God is now helping Naomi to recapture the reality of true theology. For when times were hard and she couldn't see the hand of God acting, it was like God has been so hard. And now she's starting to see life in a different direction. And now she captures, I think, more accurately what God is doing in our lives. It, it, it's not the easiness of life that determines the goodness of God, ever. It's the goodness of God that's always the goodness of God. And how that plays out into the hardness of life, we will learn that together. But now she says, the Lord is kind. And the word that she uses is the word that we've talked about a little bit before is hesed or kesed. It, it's the word that is always used to describe God's covenant love. The love that God has with his people is a love based upon his covenant, his agreement with them. I will be your God, you will be my people. You will live this way and I will do these things and we will live in, in partnership together, in relationship together. And the Hebrew word that is always, always, without exception, used to describe that covenant relationship is that one, hesed or kesed. It can be translated covenant love or like in this case where it's translated kindness. Because the circumstances have changed, her theology is starting to change. And she says, you have not forgotten your kindness. You've not forgotten your covenant of love to your people to both the living, this is pretty big jump, and I may jump further with it than what she was doing, but to both the living and the dead. She probably had in mind by the living and the dead that she and her daughter-in-law are alive, and they're seeing the kindness of God working out in their lives through these events in just this one day. When she says kind to the dead, she probably has in mind the fact that Elimelech and her two sons have died and in sort of honor or in memory of the fact that here was, here was a man whose name meant God is king or God is my king. You know, in the memory or in honor sort of of this dead husband and these dead sons, God is still demonstrating goodness to those who have died. But I think, I think her words went took us further than just maybe what she was going so <clears throat> i'm probably adding some new testament insight into this but i believe that's one of the ways that we have to read scripture we read scripture from the old testament without knowing how it concludes in the new testament yet sometimes you have to read it that way to get a glimpse of how these people thought but at other times you have to read the old testament knowing what the new testament says and back that kind of thinking up into the old testament which is what i'm going to do right here god's kindness is extended to us while we live he he is good his covenant kindness is good to us even to the extent that the hard things and the bad things of life are redeemed by his covenant love his covenant kindness but death doesn't bring an end to his covenant love and kindness to us we must never be afraid as christians to discuss the concept of death for it happens it will happen to us uh, it may not happen tonight. I kind of hope that it just waits a little while. But as we have lived in faith, we intend, we intend to die in faith. And the word of strength and comfort and help that comes to us out of this ancient text of Ruth is that even in death, God's love and kindness has not ended. It's still there. It was therefore Naomi who was alive, who recognized that even in the death of her husband, there was still a kindness and a covenant love that embraced her. So when we've lost that loved one through eyes of faith and through the help of God's Spirit, we come to see that even when death has come, 
covenant love and kindness of God is still there. Were it not for that truth, we could hardly survive that experience. But then when we pass over on the other side, we're on the other side of Jordan, perhaps in a more clear way than we have ever known in our lives, we will understand the reality and the truth of what Naomi has just said there. Even on the other side, in death, we know his love and his kindness. We will finally see it without any hard glass to look through, without any prism, without any sunglasses, without any filters, with we will finally see that perfect, radiant love that comes from the Father. To some degree, the old songwriters had it right when they said things like, I'll fly away, hallelujah, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away. They had it right. We are to live in joy and in service and in love and in labor to the Lord every day that he gives us. And when we pass into his presence, the very best has begun. We say that with faith. Maybe we stretch Naomi's intent a little bit, but I think it's absolutely correct. And I think you believe that too. So, oh, may he be blessed of the Lord. He has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, the man is our relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers is the word the, the word is goel or gael or something sort of like that my hebrew is not terribly good it too appears 150 160 times or so in the in the old testament it appears more in ruth than just about any other book especially when you think ruth only has four chapters it's going to appear a number of times in the old te in the in the law, like in Leviticus. Uh, next week we'll have more time. We might go look at a couple of passages over there. But here we get introduced to another one of those ideas in Ruth that's bigger than Ruth. Just like her words, "He is kind to the living and the dead." I think it was bigger than Ruth's understanding. She has called this relative a kinsman redeemer. We are introduced to an Old Testament concept where a person could be in poverty and have a family member that would come along and buy them out of poverty, even to the point that on occasion, a family would sell themselves into slavery in those Old Testament days because they were in such hard straits. And then someone in their family could come along as their kinsman redeemer and buy them back out of slavery there are multiple passages especially around Leviticus chapter 25 there are a goodly number of them that talk about just that sort of thing and so now we're seeing we're seeing this family that's had such a hard time and here's Naomi and here's Ruth and they are at the mercy of God and the kindness of a stranger who turns out to be a family member and what they're going to find out is here comes a character into the story who's going to redeem the whole thing just like when we get to Christ. We're going to find character in the historical story who's going to redeem the whole thing. We have a type of Christ showing up in Boaz. Well, no wonder this story gets here into the Old Testament at this point because she is going to be the great grandmother of David of course who prefigures Christ in so many ways just this 
beautiful, poetic hand of the Creator who not only weaves His will into history, makes it dramatic and spectacular and love stories and palpitating hearts. And in the middle of all of that stirs us up in faith to see that this is what Christ does to us. He takes us out of the brokenness and the lostness of life and redeems us unto himself so that we come to experience this magnificent covenant love that holds us and never lets us go. Ruth didn't know she said that much, so we helped her a little. Oh, all right. Well, it's been a good day all the way around. Thank you for being here this morning and tonight and for all the work that many of you have done through the day. Some of you maybe have given blood. Others of you have given time to committees. And oh, Do we still have some money, Doc? All right, good. That's good enough for me. Great. Now we have a week to go and live out, live out the results of the worship we've had today. Let's pray. Father God, your word is just always sweet. Even when it challenges us with hard stuff, it's always sweet. It reminds us over and over again of your goodness. And Lord, we, we need to be reminded of that because we confront the vicissitudes of life on every side the haphazardness of sickness and disease, the randomness of storms that blow through and tear up our houses. What looks like a world sort of out of control in so many ways, especially in these days, we come to the truth of your word that tells us that you are in control for generations you shaped this family to bring about that shepherd boy who would transform Jewish history in so many ways. And none of our names will ever be in the history books. But our names are known by the everlasting God. And we see how you're working in our lives and we are grateful help us Lord as grateful people to share Christ with our community this week help us to do that we pray these things in the name of Jesus our Lord amen and amen good night everyone thanks for being here